call this meeting of the Conroe Independent School District Board of Trustees to order. Let the record show that a quorum of members is present, that this meeting has been duly called, and that notice of this meeting has been posted in accordance with Texas Open Meetings Act, Texas Government Code Chapter 551. The time is now 6 o'clock. Uh, please join me in rising while Mr. Hubert leads us in the invocation and Mr. Williams in the Pledge of Allegiance. Feel free to join me if you, if you choose so. Our dear Heavenly Father, we are grateful for this, this day that we have to meet here in this building. We are grateful for the opportunity we have in this country to, to assimilate and to govern in this manner and watch over the, the funds of, of all of the people here <clears throat> for the taxes for this, for this school district. We are grateful for the students and for the teachers and the administration and for all of those who make uh, this, this possible and help lead our youth in, in development and the choices that they make later on in life. We ask you to, wa to watch over them, watch over the teachers and the students as they wrap up their summer time, that they'll be ready and well, well rested for school to start. We invite our spirit to be with us this day and help us in our, be in our hearts and our minds and help us govern this day. We ask this thing of our Savior Jesus Christ, amen. 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 To the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to the Texas, one state, under God, one and indivisible. Thank you both very much. Uh, item 2A, Special District Recognition, Texas Smart Schools, five-star rating, Connor ISD, Dr. Knoll. All right, we'll ask Dr. Chris Hines to present this item. Good evening, President Bush, members of the board, Dr. Knoll. Uh, it's actually uh, uh, very much an honor for me to be able to present this item to you. This is really a, an, an item about recognizing your work uh, among, as well as the work of the entire district um, in that we have received our um, five-star rating again from the Texas Smart Schools. And in order to earn the five-star Smart Score rating, a district or a campus must be in the best 20% in the two key dimensions, academic progress and cost-effective finances, which of course really requires the strategic uh, use of our resources. And, um, and, so, and that's very much a recognition of your leadership. Uh, so we're very excited tonight, and um, rather than explain all of it, I think it's going to be explained in a video that features none other than our chief financial officer, Mr. Darren Rice, and he'll explain um, the, uh, the award. So we'll let the video tell the story. All right. Turn the down. Conroe ISD believes strongly in being a good steward of taxpayers' dollars and providing a world-class education for our children and is proud to again be celebrating the awarding of a five-star rating from Texas Smart Schools for such an achievement. This recognition specifically goes to those school districts who rank in the top 20% in two key areas, academic progress and cost-effective finances. Texas Smart Schools uses academic, financial, and demographic data to identify school districts and campuses that produce high academic achievement while also maintaining cost-effective operations. Once known as the Financial Allocation Study of Texas, or FAST Report, CISD is one of only three districts out of over 1,000 to receive the five-star rating annually since the inception of the FAST Report and the Texas Smart Schools Program nine years ago. Conroe ISD is a proud recipient of the Texas Smart School five-star rating and takes pride in the fact that we are a high academic achieving district while maintaining a conservative approach in the use and management of our constituents' tax funding. Explore the data yourself and see how CISD compares to other districts in the state by going to the Texas Smart Schools website. Hey, Mr. Price. Oh. So the oh, video, nice, the video yeah, pretty much nice. explained it, and um, you can see. But we we're we we're of only one of three districts that have received that award uh, nine years in a row since the the program began. And we're very proud of that, and uh, 
we just wanted to recognize you and the work and your leadership that helped us achieve that. So thank you. Well, and I know none of us up here take this for granted. This is something huge to be one of only three for nine years in a row. And I know that we'd all be thrilled to have it be 10 years in a row next year, but it's nothing you can take for granted. It goes into all of your hard work. So thank you all very much. I also want to give an acknowledgement to uh, yeah. Andrew Stewart, who's here, and he's in our communications department, who uh, helped put our video together. Man, that was Wonderful nice. Job. Man, that was nice. <laughs> I, I thought Darren was running for politics on that. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't recognize him without his tie. Yeah. Uh, that was nice. It was a very casual look. Like, <laughs> I did that well, very well. Item 2B, uh, Special District <clears throat> Recognition Ambassador Awards District Support Staff, Dr. Knoll. All right, Ms. Blakelock will present our award winners from the administration building. Good evening, President Bush, members of the board, and Dr. Knoll. It is my pleasure to be with you tonight to introduce some of our amazing employees that we have in our district. We're incredibly fortunate in Con RC to have these dedicated and outstanding employees who support our functions that then support the success of our students on the campuses. And so tonight, um, we're going to be introducing five recipients uh, for our 2018 Ambassador Award for our administrative departments. And so each of these individuals exemplify excellence and provide exceptional service to the district. So as I call your name, please come forward and remain up front until all awardees have been called. Okay. So we'll now begin with Celeste Brown. <laughs> Celeste Brown started with Conroe ISD last summer and is the administrative assistant in the communications department. And in addition to being incredibly efficient and motivated to take on new projects, she's eager to help in any way possible. Additionally, if you've ever met her, her cheerful voice and demeanor are a constant, and nobody believes she is capable of a harsh tone. <laughs> so, <laughs> Celeste's talents have allowed the communications department to support the district in ever increasing ways, and we're so blessed to have her as part of our family. Amen. Next up, we have Cindy Westrup. So, Yes. Cindy joined the finance department 16 years ago as a staff accountant and was promoted to senior accountant in 2014. She's a true asset to the department and serves as a valuable resource to all campuses and departments. The quality of work and positive attitude that Cindy brings to the department have been invaluable. We are so grateful to have you as part of our team in Conroe IC and the finance team. Thank you, Cindy, for your dedication and all you do for the district. Lorraine Jingo. <laughs> Lorraine began her employment in Conroe ISD. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> Precious. That is perfect. Precious. <laughs> you know, it's so much cuteness, I'll wait until. <laughs> Lorraine began her employment in Conroe ISD as a budget clerk at the Woodlands High School. She joined the Human Resources team eight years ago and has been an outstanding employee in the role of employment specialist. This year, she received her tenure pin for service to the district. Lorraine works closely with auxiliary departments and processes all paperwork associated with employee transfers and the onboarding process for new hires, which we're adding about 550 professional new hires this year, so it's no small feat. <laughs> She's been busy. <laughs> when looking for someone who is committed to excellent work and who cares for the well-being of the employees she serves, Lorraine is the person. She's valued and loved in the HR department. <laughs> Sabrina Frazier. Sabrina began in CIC 17 years ago as an AP secretary serving at both Pete Junior High and Conroe High School. And for the past 12 years, she has served in the special education department as a secretary. Sabrina assists all staff in the department with many different activities and does it with a smile. She's funny and personable and works hard to support the department wherever she is needed. She is also quick to support other departments when called upon. We are so proud to have her on our team and in our district. And last but certainly not least, Stephanie Carbonaro. <laughs> St 
Stephanie joined Connor ISD in 2014 as a member of the technology department's financial systems support team. In December of 2016, she was promoted to the lead role on that team. Under her leadership, the team has successfully helped the human resources and finance departments automate many processes. She's always looking for ways her team can help and innovate. Her commitment to serving the finance and HR department shows in everything she does. And the technology department, along with the district, are excited to be able to honor her as an ambassador. Please join me in welcoming them all, or congratulating them all one more time. <laughs> Thank you all again for your service. Let, let me just say a couple of words while y'all shake other hands, but uh, it, it's people like this that make that five star and all the other accolades that this district gets, uh, people behind the scenes. It takes every single person, and we are so thankful for that all, all that y'all do and how well you do it. So thank you again. Right, item 2C, Special District Recognition, Conroe ISD and the, and the Fine Arts Department, the NAM Foundation Best Communities for Music Education Award. Dr. Right, Noll. Dr. Dr. Bob Horton is here tonight, our coordinator of Fine Arts, to present this exciting item. Good evening, President Bush, members of the board, and Dr. Noll. I am excited to share with you that Conroe ISD has received a 2018 designation as a Best Community for Music Education. Let me thank you, our CISD Board of Trustees, for your support and our administrative staff that allow opportunities like this to be possible. Just a little background, the Best Communities in Music Education Award is a nationwide recognition program that is selected by the National Association of Music Merchants, or NAM Foundation. The NAM Foundation is a nonprofit organization that is committed to advancing music education through active participation. In the last 19 years of this survey, it is a nationwide search for communities who provide access to music education as an essential part of a complete education and who exemplify commitment to and support for music education. This survey measured a variety of factors, including budgetary commitment to music education, opportunities for students to learn music, the presence of highly qualified certified music teachers, adherence to state and national standards, types of musical experiences offered and opportunities for performance and competition and several other factors. A community had to show that they are committed to access and high standards for music education in all areas to be named a best community. To earn this designation, we submitted a 38 page survey with information about our school district community and our instructional practices. Of the 14,000 potential applicants, over 2,000 school districts applied. Conroe ISD was one of the 535 in the nation to earn this designation, this national award. Two thoughts from the NAM Foundation about this award perfectly describe Conroe ISD. First, the best communities in music education designation is awarded to districts that demonstrate outstanding achievement in efforts to provide music access and education to all students. Districts that have been recognized by the NAM Foundation are often held up as models for other educators looking to boost their own music education programs. 2018 is the seventh consecutive year that CISD has been named a best community for music education. During the summer, it's a little hard to get them all here to celebrate this, uh, but we do have some of our uh, music educators here with us tonight, and I invite them to stand and uh, for me to thank them publicly for coming out and being so nice to dress. <laughs> I just want to say again personally thank you for um, allowing this uh, opportunity for recognition for our music education programs in Conroe ISD and all that you do for us. Dr. Horton, in, in recognition of the outstanding job that your department has done, all of these music educators, uh, we have this um, beautiful um, 
framed poster here for you. I don't know what to call it. Um, recognizing Conroe ISD um, is outstanding support of music education from the NAM Foundation. I am very proud to tell people that I myself am a product of CISD's music education. Um, we have so many of our, our students who return to us as music educators, go on to professional music careers, um, but so many of them go on to other careers, and music education is so important. It's such a high priority for this board uh, to see that fine arts in general receive high priority in this district, and we're, we're honored to do that for the students, for you, and we thank the educators that are here for the hard work and the, the well-rounded individuals that they turn our students into. Thank you, sir. Congratulations. Appreciate it very much. If we have any other music teachers in the audience, please join us. <laughs> at least one of them, at least one at least one one. Of them had to be. <laughs> <laughs> Item 2D, receive the Conroe ISD Education Foundation update. Dr. Knoll. Well, as you know, we are so fortunate to have the Conroe ISD Education Foundation. It is truly a model uh, that other districts look at, and um, they're envious of what we have. And, and we wouldn't have what we have without great volunteers. I'm going to recognize uh, just a couple of our board members before I introduce our executive director. We have uh, Ms. Nelda Blair and Mr. Jim Blair here. They're board members. We thank you for being here tonight and the work that you do. Um, for our foundation and our, our one-man band truly, <laughs> truly um, we wouldn't have what we have without our great executive director Thank she you. works tirelessly to make sure um, that all these things are possible what you'll hear tonight is possible for our students and that's Miss Maris Blair our executive director so uh, we look forward to your report I well, appreciate it thank you very much for the compliments good evening uh, superintendent trustees administration my name is Maris Blair, and I am the executive director of the Conroe ISD Education Foundation. And Dr. Knowles already introduced Nelda Blair, the president of the foundation, and Jim Blair, who's also on the board. I do have a report that I laid in front of you. I'm going to make it short, sweet, to the point, and just give you the great news. The first page is a breakdown of all of our scholarships that we do award every year. This year, we awarded 13 student scholarships. We awarded 136 continuing education scholarships. And these are the recipients that you are an employee here and you are seeking a higher degree and you must have your bachelor degree. So this year it was a record, 136. Uh, the all means all, I think we're familiar with this one. Sam Cable, the gentleman that just retired, wonderful man, is the driving force behind this scholarship. And this year we awarded 10 to the ninth graders at the Conroe uh, ninth grade campus. And paraprofessionals, this is our third year for this scholarship. And this year, we awarded 32 <laughs> of those paraprofessionals who are bilingual or in special education. And of course, this is the scholarship that comes from the Dr. Um, Earl Stockton's Memorial Scholarship Fund that Dr. Stockton set up in memory of his father. On the second page, uh, in November of 2017, we gave away $7,300 MasterCard gift cards to your new teachers who were CISD graduates. That's really neat that they come back to work for you. Um, and I wanted to give a quick little thank you to the BBVA Compass Bank on this one, because this year they supplied the cards by waiving all the activation fees for the foundation wow. again. So thank you, BBVA. We couldn't do it without them. Uh, our website, we're proud of our website. Uh, if you get a second, please go take a look at it. I'm going to skip the scholarship breakfast because I think everybody's aware we didn't have a breakfast this year. <laughs> I'm aware of it. I hope you are. <laughs> uh, so I just wanted to kind of give you an update about how much we've raised at the dinner honoring Dr. Stockton. Over 360000 Awesome. Yeah. Great. Very excited. 
Next page is just the details about every student and what scholarship they received from the foundation. And I wanted to point out two new scholarships that were given out this year. The first one was the Dick and Mary Cole Special Needs Education Scholarship. Uh, your trustee here, John Husbands, can explain a little bit about that, but it's a great scholarship that we're looking for somebody who's wanting to get into education to help in special education, help the special needs children. And we had one this year that specifically stated in her essays, that's what she wants to do. So, perfect recipient for that one. And the next new one is the NOAC Foundation Scholarship. Commissioner uh, Nowak set up a found, uh, his foundation and they awarded $2,500 this year for a one-time scholarship fee and Miss Abigail Grace Johnson received that this year. The next page just breaks down all the names, numerous names, of uh, the All Means All recipients, the paraprofessional scholarship recipients, and two and a half pages <laughs> of continuing education recipients. Every name is important on this because uh, they deserve what they're doing and congratulate to them for going back to school. Got to love it. The last two pages, I'm very proud to promote these companies and state that CISD has some of the best vendors because they give back to your community. That's important to me. And these are two pages of vendors who deserve kudos because they support the foundation every year. And of course, one gentleman, our presenting sponsor this year was PBK. We couldn't do what we do without PBK. Uh, any questions? No. Are you going to go back to a breakfast next year? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> she said with a big smile. <laughs> oh, I may not have seen that from back there. Yes. <laughs> big smile. Get a new dress next year. <laughs> yeah. so, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. I, you know, I just wanted to conclude by saying it is an honor to be up here to give this report on behalf of the foundation to such an awesome board. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, item 2E, Ms. Godfrey, has anyone signed up to address the board? No. All right. Item 3 is a consent agenda. I have not had any requests to remove any items. Motion we'll to accept the agenda as presented. Second. All right. All those in favor? Motion passes. Item 4A, receive 2018 star 3 through 8 and EOC results. All right. I'll invite Dr. Phillips and Mr. Colson to come forward and present that information. All right, good evening, President Bush, members of the board, Dr. Null. This evening, Mr. Colshan and I are, are pleased to present the 2018 preliminary STAR scores. We're really proud of our kids and the work that our, our teachers have done. And we say preliminary because the final scores do not come out until August, as you'll recall. The scores we're presenting tonight include the scores of all students that took the assessment. Um, and between now and August, the state will go back, clean up the data, remove the scores of any students that were not continually enrolled with us for most of the year. Once scores are finalized, we're going to give you a more comp comprehensive view of where we are. So since the new uh, STAR assessment came out, we've been following a pretty consistent pattern, and this year is no different. For the most part, if, this, if the state goes up in an area from one year to the next, we typically go up. If the state drops in one area from one year to the next, we typically drop. Um, there are just a few variances when we do break the pattern, but it's usually just a point or two away from that. So let's take a look. Uh, third grade reading, you can see that the state increased, and in this case, so did we in, in uh, Conroe ISD. Third grade math uh, declined by one, one percentage point this year. Fourth grade reading remained constant in Conroe, and fourth grade math increased by 2%. In fourth grade writing, the state uh, decreased by 2% and Conroe has decreased by 1%. Fifth grade reading, uh, Conroe decreased by 2% and in math, we increased by, 90, by 1%, 94%. Fifth grade science remained constant. Sixth grade reading decreased by 1%, just like the state. 
um, in math, sixth grade math, we increased by 1%. So I'll turn it over to Mr. Kolsch and take a look at secondary. <coughs> Thank you, Dr. Phillips. Before presenting the data, I want to thank all of our secondary teachers and students for their hard work in preparing for these important assessments. I'd also like to thank Dr. Taylor and the assessment team for helping us compile this information so that we can give you as up-to-date information as possible. Uh, in our junior high results, seventh grade uh, reading saw our percentage increase 1% uh, from the previous year. Our seventh grade math rate uh, increased 3% from 2017, and the state also saw the same gain of 3%. Seventh grade writing, uh, we maintained at 76%, while the state experienced a 1% decrease. On eighth grade reading uh, and math scores represent first and second round cumulative data. Cumulative data. In reading, CISD experienced a 2% decrease uh, with an 88% passing rate while the state showed a 1% decrease. In math, uh, our eighth grade students passed that math portion uh, at 93%, which was level from the previous year, uh, while the state stayed the same as well. Eighth grade science, uh, we experienced a 1% decrease. Uh, we still maintained a 10% advantage over the statewide scores. Social studies in eighth grade, uh, we had the same passing rate at 77%. At the high school level, the passing rate of CISD students continues to be strong in relationship to statewide scores. English 1 EOC uh, is 73%, uh, which was the same as the year before. And in English 2, we saw 2% 2 more of our students pass the EOC than the previous year, while the state also showed an increase. Algebra 1. 88% of our Algebra 1 students passed the exam, compared to 83% statewide. Our freshman biology students passed the EOC at a 92% success rate, compared to the statewide score of 87%. At the U.S. History junior level course, 97% uh, of our students passed, compared to 92% of the students statewide. Again, like, as Dr. Phillips mentioned earlier, these are preliminary results and could change slightly when final scores are released in August. Thank you. I have Questions? one question. Um, there was a rather highly publicized computer glitch during the April administration. Do these numbers reflect any adjustments by the state on their part for their technical deficiency? <laughs> <laughs> they, they do have a plan to rectify that if we f we had to file an appeal on the scores that we felt like we needed to have them take a second look at. And I'll be honest with you, I'm not sure if Dr. Taylor did that or not. Mm -hmm. Are you aware? We, we only had about 200 tests yeah. district-wide, and we didn't feel like any of them were to the okay. point where it affected their, yeah. their Performance. ability to be successful. Yeah. Um, but we'll go back and review all of those. To make <laughs> so those adjustments. What you're seeing tonight is you know, raw data. Mm -hmm. Okay. No adjustments. I have a question as well. Do we, on these particular test scores, do we ever, do we compare them to our peers, or is that appropriate Absolutely. or not appropriate? Yes. Yeah. So the, the the report that you'll see typically in October, that that longer yes. uh, academic report, oh, when we will show the district overall scores, and you'll see the our peer districts will be um, listed with alongside those scores okay yeah they don't typically put those out until August since yeah. everything is still preliminary okay very good thank you anything further thank you item <laughs> item 5a receive information on the naming process for the new Conroe ISD campuses all right Dr. Dr. Hines. <laughs> good evening again um, Tonight, I'd like to bring to you as information uh, just kind of a quick overview of the uh, naming process for new campuses. Um, and as, as you are well aware, and uh, we, next year we'll have Flex 19, that is a K6 campus located in the Oak Ridge feeder zone that's scheduled to open in August. Um, that's located at uh, 10261 Harper School Road in the Harper's Preserve neighborhood. So. Um, that is coming online next fall and then in 2000 in August of 2020 we have a new junior high school that is uh, in the Conroe feeder that's 
just right behind uh, Bosman Intermediate on 2750 CISD School Road. That's the road that intersects between 3083 and the Loop. Mm -hmm. uh, so that school will come on in 2020. So um, tonight we want to, to bring to you this information that will begin the process. Uh, up on the screen is the website, and it has some information about our policy on school naming. And then there's two places where someone can, uh, you know, click on it and it'll open up a little file and you can put a name suggestion in. It is required that they put in a rationale, like why they want, why they recommend that name. Um, and then they submit it and they have, to, they have to click off, they're not a robot. <laughs> uh, and, you know, and, and then it usually will say, you know, thank you for your submission. That's how you know it went in. Uh, and so we have one of those on each of those two schools. Uh, and we expect to receive, you know, many, many and numerous suggestions for names. Uh, the plan is that a month from now, we'll, I'll come back to you and we'll share with you the, the names that were suggested as possible names for those two schools. And then if if, if you're ready, a month later we'll come back and we, uh, I think last time we had two items on that on mm -hmm. that board meeting where we had an item for discussion and then followed by another item to take action on naming the campuses. So if that meets your approval, we'll plan to follow that timeline uh, and it'll begin starting tomorrow. Can you so, right? see the timeline again? Okay. So you can see August 21st when we plan to bring you the names that we shared and then uh, it'll it, and if you at that time are ready, we will come back a month later at the September board meeting. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Item five B: Consider acceptance <clears throat> of the 2014 lighting retrofit project and authorize final payment. Dr. Knoll. All right. Uh, Easy Foster will come up actually um, to present to us the next three items. Good evening, President Bush, members of the board, and Dr. Nall. It's my pleasure to bring forward for your acceptance a completed project. This project is our 2014 lighting retrofit project. If you'll recall, this was a project to retrofit uh, light fixtures, specifically T12 fluorescent lighting, which had been um, phased out of production. Also, uh, the timing was right to maximize the rebate from our energy provider for that particular, uh, replacing that particular technology. <clears throat> Over the course of this project, we retrofitted uh, just more than 16,000 light fixtures throughout the district. So the project is now complete, uh, and this time we're asking for your uh, acceptance of the project as complete. So moved. Any questions? 16,000? <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right. All those in favor? Thank you. Item uh, 5C, acceptance of the 2016 Grangerland additions and authorized final payment. At this time, we're requesting your acceptance as complete a project, which was uh, adding classrooms at Grangerland Intermediate. Uh, the project also uh, expanded the driveway for Cox Intermediate to help alleviate the uh, traffic problems in front of that school to so get more of the parent drop-off and parent pickup traffic onto our property rather than staging on the, mm -hmm. on the public street. That project is complete. Uh, we've been using those facilities for some time now, and we're asking for your uh, acceptance of those projects as complete so we can make final payment. So moved. Second. Uh, the only thing I, I would like to publicly state, and I know it's in the board book for anybody who picked up the full packet, but correct me if I'm wrong, we saved around $350,000 total uh, well, project savings. It was, it was uh, $399,000 oh, savings. Oh, pardon me. And the previous one was 40 ish well, in the previous one was 45, okay. but I would like to also point out in the previous one, we expended all of our allowance and contingency money purchasing light fixtures. Mm -hmm. So we put those light fixtures in our warehouse. Uh, so our main department has been using them to replace fixtures as the other fixtures died within the district. Uh, so we've expanded that beyond the 16,000 we actually did, we did replace. Well, thank you for managing the projects well and saving our taxpayers that money. We really appreciate that. Any other? <clears throat> all those in favor? Thank you, Mr. Foster. Uh, capital improvements update. At this time, I'd like to bring you up speed on our capital improvements we have that are underway throughout the project. So I'm going to start with Grand Oaks High School. So Grand Oaks High School opens next month when the students come back for uh, the 2018-2019 school year. So you can see from our pictures the life of that, that campus is 
really taking shape. Uh, it's home of the Grizzlies, and as we will see from another picture here very shortly, uh, there are future Grizzlies out on the ball fields running in the uh, athletic camps as we speak. So the project is on time. It will open. Uh, Dr. Povich and his team are moving into the admin portions of it now. We'll be ready when the faculty comes in uh, in just a little bit. And when the students come here for the first day of school, we'll be standing there waving them in the front door. Wonderful. At Catherine Johnson Clark Intermediate, this school is also opening with uh, Grand Oaks on August the 15th. Uh, we've been working with uh, Miss Ardwan, our new principal, to get her moved into the admin section, get ready that building ready for new student uh, registrations, things of that nature. So the building is coming along very nicely. You can see from the inside, we're loading it with books and learning materials and furniture and all that other other stuff it takes to run a, a, a five and six campus. Uh, so we are working through technology, setting, setting everything up right now. I mean, so it is a, a ongoing process, but it is, uh, we'll be ready for the staff when they come back and when the students come back on the first day, we'll be at that campus as well to welcome them in the front door. You can see here, uh, I'd like to point out the picture on the wall, which is actually a room sign that uses the school colors to point out the stairwells, because some of our administrators think that's a really neat way to use the school colors. <laughs> So moving on towards our uh, life cycle. There's a backstory there. <laughs> There's always backstory. I'm more we'll get back to my, my, my comedic time later in my presentation. <clears throat> but our uh, life cycle 2018 project, which is our project that we replace things that wear out naturally over time. Uh, some of our work is at athletic improvements. This is a picture of the track at Irons, which is at mid year mid life of that track system for that building. So we've got a fresh new coat of, uh, a, like a seal coat of rubber over the top of the track surface and new stripes. Uh, so that project is proceeding well. We're doing those at the Woodlands ninth grade uh, and a, a Moorhead Junior High as well. So those projects are on schedule and moving forward uh, just as we had planned. Uh, this is a picture of the new dance floor that's installed at Oak Ridge High School. Uh, so we were able to replace a, a rubber dance floor that had breached the end of its lifespan. So they've got a new uh, competition style uh, wood dance floor like we're installing at other high schools currently. This is the roof at Glenlock Elementary, which is about 90% complete. It's on schedule and will be clear of the uh, first day school activities when the students come back, so it is right where we need to be. And in addition to work like this, we've replaced chillers at Moorhead. We've done electrical improvements around the district, some plumbing improvements. All in all, over the course of uh, this project, we'll have touched 31 campuses uh, from small minor scopes of work to big scopes of work like at the natatorium we saw we replaced the entire air conditioning system <coughs> uh, over, the, over the past several months. Remind me again the scope of that project, At 40 the, million? No, the, this 31 campus project was uh, just here over $12 million. That's 12. <coughs> Slow summer. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> now our safety and security project, this is phase three, which is our final phase. This used up all of our 2015 bond money. Uh, so the focus over the summer is the secure vestibules, getting the, the uh, the service windows for our reception area is done. So you're looking at the window that's at Rice Elementary. So all of the service windows will be ready for uh, students when they come back uh, on the first day of school. So, and then we'll resume our work above the ceilings on the cameras and access control updates. Uh, this summer, this project is touching 13 campuses. And over the course of our safety and security project, we've touched all of our elementaries, all of our intermediates. Uh, all but York Junior High at the junior high level, and then we have, still have York Junior High in our high schools for future projects as we move forward. Flex 19, which hopefully will have a new name over the next couple months, and I'll be able to put a nice logo as we select the logos over the, over the course of the, uh, uh, the life of this project. Uh, this one's in the dirt, so it is on schedule. Uh, it's scheduled to open in August of 2019, and currently we've, we've completed the foundation work we're working on great beans building slab and over the next uh, month or so the structural steel will arrive and that building will begin to go vertical uh, as we progress through that still project. incredible to me that you can build a school in a year <laughs> build a school what build a school in a year oh, but, you know this is where it is now and next august we're opening the doors well we, we've got a good team that works together to put it put it yeah. together I, it, it's not me i can tell you that for sure <laughs> we've got a contract on the weather too so. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah we need to call somebody on that contract but so far yeah. we've been, <laughs> been able to overcome that now at austin elementary where we're doing an addition that is allowing us to decommission portions of that building that have reached at the end of its useful life 
Uh, that project is also in the dirt. So we're currently doing uh, foundation work there, uh, and we'll be rapidly moving towards the grade beams and slabs and bringing that building vertical as well over the next uh, several weeks. Uh, that project is also on schedule, uh, and we're going to turn that project over uh, sometime in 2019 for use, and then we'll move to the demolition portion of the uh, buildings that come down. Uh, so we'll be on that uh, on that project through uh, through the summer of 2019. Do we, do we get to have one? Of, yeah, you go step in a hole. Yeah, I was going to say, were you busy student. texting him at that <laughs> moment? I mean, he had his hard hat on. I guy would call that. But I will point out that that young man there is actually inspecting the hole. Oh, oh that's, 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 that's perfect. <laughs> that, 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 that was solid. Is he taking a picture of it? That's an OSHA guy. Right? In, in actuality, he is taking a picture of it. Oh, I can assure you my project coordinator for that job is uh, uh, very adamant about people not being able to fall in holes. <laughs> uh, at Irons Junior High, where we're adding some classrooms to increase the capacity at Irons Junior High School, uh, the building structure's up. The roof is uh, about ready to go on. We're working inside on the building system, so you see the conduit. Uh, you see the crews applying fireproofing to the structural steel is what we're looking at now. We've also got the exterior walls being able to uh, come up. This project, uh, the classrooms are turning over uh, during the winter break so that our students will be able to use them uh, when they return from the winter break in January. Our new junior high school, which will also get a new name very soon, uh, which is directly behind Bosman Intermediate, uh, that project is in the dirt as well. So we're uh, actively uh, drilling the foundations, and that project, just like Flex 19 in Austin, will be moving into gray beam and slab. Uh, it's a larger structure by, uh, by a large margin, so it would progress through the slab and things on nature a bit slower. Uh, but it is on schedule, and it's scheduled to open in August of 2020. For Conroe High School, our additions uh, project, which is allowing us to renovate the main building and all the air conditioning systems in that in that main building. Uh, the, the building addition is on schedule, scheduled to turn over at winter break uh, like we planned. So the, the central plant, uh, which is the heart and soul of the new uh, upgrades, is actually active and running the air conditioning in the uh, eastern half of this uh, building. As you're looking down the hall, so you're seeing the ceiling grid going in, things of that nature. They're closing up the western end of the building, so the whole building will be closed up over the next month or so, and we'll be proceeding to floor and finishes and paint, things of that nature, over the, over the coming weeks. So that project is also getting to the favorite picture from the last board meeting, which was that nice, clean ceiling area in the uh, library. So the work in the library is wrapping up. So you're seeing the ceiling grid go back in. The new ductwork systems and the piping systems for the library are, are back in place. We'll be covering those up uh, next week and then turning the library back over for our use as a school district uh, on July the 30th, ahead of the, the staff coming back and the, certainly ahead of the st students coming back. And as we progress through that project, we'll be working on the, the plan with the campus to phase the rest of the renovations in the main building as we work, work, work move students into the new addition, then work our way around the building. And that is our update. Thank you, Mr. Foster. All right. Item 6A, receive preliminary 2018-2019 proposed budget. All right, Mr. Rice. Get this tie back. <clears throat> mm -hmm. The tie looks good. <laughs> it's like a star. Yeah. That's right. Like I said, I'll be doing autographs in the back. <laughs> <laughs> Won't be a long line. <laughs> Just a few minutes, right? <laughs> if that. <laughs> Well, good evening, President Bush, members of the board, and Dr. Noll. It is my pleasure to present to you the 2018-2019 preliminary budget. I can find the mouse. Okay. I like to start each of our presentations on the budget uh, with our financial highlights from the current year. And although we're proud of all of them, we're just going to concentrate on a few of these. Uh, the district continues to get recognized from the state comptroller's office for our transparency presentations. We receive transparency stars for our traditional finances debt obligations and contract and procurement presentations. And each of these presentations can be found on the district's transparency uh, website. Uh, the board transferred $8 million of surplus fund balance this year. And that transfer to the capital projects fund was primarily for the irons addition that Mr. Foster just talked to us about uh, earlier. And we're able to do that without adding new debt. So that is a great program the board has. 
And as we all know, the district has received the five-star rating from the Texas Smart Schools. Very proud of that. This next slide, our, our tax rate com comparison. Our tax rate of $1.28, and I think this is important, is 48 cents lower than our tax rate was in 0506 when it was $1.76. We are 20 cents below our peer average tax rate, and we're 15 cents below the closest district to us, which is Klein. And I think as you see as budgets are rolling out, our position is going to improve even better since we're not requesting a tax increase this year. What is Magnolia's going to go to with, if it passes? Yeah, I, I, I don't recall off the top okay. of my head, but I can get that information for okay. you. <clears throat> Our general fund balance. This chart represents the fund balance of the general fund over the past 10 years. In 2008, our fund balance was $76 million. And in 2017, we ended at $134 million. And during this time, the board has transferred excess fund balance from the general fund to capital projects. These transfers have, had allowed us to do several large construction pro projects while avoiding adding new debt. If we included the $8 million that we transferred this year, the board will have transferred over $100 million from the general fund to capital projects, and this has helped us to maintain a low debt service tax rate and avoid adding new debt. The transferred amounts are identified in the red blocks on each of the years, and then the projects are listed below. Our fund balance analysis, our objective is to maintain an unassigned fund balance of 25% of the annual budget, and this gives us about three months' worth of expenses. Our unassigned fund balance at 831.17 was $129.6 million, which is 28% of the budget and $11.34 million over our 25% target. <clears throat> we will now look at the major components that drive the budget, and they begin with our 2018-2019 budget objectives, and they are to meet the needs for the 2018-2019 school year, and that includes the opening of Grand Oaks High School and Clark Intermediate. We want to provide a competitive raise and additional salary adjustments for identified areas, and we want to provide additional safety and securities at our campuses. And we want to utilize a surplus to support capital projects, reduce bond debt requirements, and cover any unforeseen expenditures. And as always, we want to achieve high academic outcomes in a cost-efficient manner. Attendance data. Our state revenue estimates and campus expenditure budget allocations rely on our enrollment data. For the upcoming 2018-2019 budget, we're using an enrollment increase of 1,400 students for a total enrollment of 63,014 students. And we're using 94% for our average daily attendance. And I always like to say it is important to note that the expenditure budget is based on enrollment and the state funding is based on average daily attendance. Our enrollment, 6314. Average daily attendance at 94% is 59,233. So, so that difference. <clears throat> Our enrollment trend, now as we look at our, we can look at our student growth graphically and you can see that we've been pretty steady at about 1,500 students per year. <clears throat> certified property values, we're using an estimated 5.7% growth in our assessed value. The growth will add about $1.9 billion to our property values, bringing our total values to $35.7 billion. Mm -hmm. And we should have certified values, hopefully this week, but no later than the 25th. And now that we have discussed the major components that drive the budget, we will now look at the effect that they have on the budget itself, starting with our 2018-2019 funding estimate. Our tax revenue increase, based off of an estimated 5.7% AV growth, will generate $19.09 million. Uh, state revenue, with our 1,400 new students, will generate $2.12 million. And our investment income will increase, based on higher interest rates, by $1.22 million given us a total estimated available new funding of $22.43 million. Now taking a look at it, the expenditure side of the budget, this is our 2018-2019 salary increase. The increase will cost $9.2 million. It includes a 2.5% raise for our professional staff and a 3% raise for all support, auxiliary, and police department. This is our approved 2018-2019 teacher hiring schedule. Once again, it includes a 2.5% general pay increase, which is $1,450, and a starting teacher salary of $53,700. Uh, personnel for Grove for support at the campus level to accommodate 1,400 new students and the opening of Grand Oaks High School and Clark Intermediate School includes 164 and a half new positions at a cost of about $8 million. 
And these positions are made up of 98 teachers, eight administrators, nine professionals, and 49 and a half paraprofessionals. And then to support our campuses, we're adding 74 and a half new positions. And these positions are mainly for our transportation and police and maintenance departments. And that's at a cost of about $2.6 million. So totally, we're adding 239 new positions at a cost of $10.98 million. So this is our projected expenditure budget increase for 2018-2019. Our additional personnel for growth, $10.98 million. Salary increase is $9.2 million. We have an adjustment to our <coughs> payroll budget of $1 million. And then other expenses, utilities, fuel, and supplies, $3.23 million. Utilities, mainly for the two new campuses that we're opening. Uh, fuel for new bus routes and the increased cost of fuel. Uh -huh. um, that's given us total new expenses of $22.43 million. So this is our 2018-2019 projected budget, looking at revenues and expenditures together. On the revenue side, our beginning budget was $473 million, adding $22.43 million worth of new revenue, giving us a projected revenue budget of $495.46 million. On the expenditure side of the budget, our beginning budget was $473 million, and we're adding $22.43 million worth of expenses, giving us a projected 1819 expenditure budget of $495.46 million dollars. This is a balanced budget. The $22.43 million is equal to a 4.74% budget increase. And as we've talked in the past, the legislature, we've seen several bills that say that they want to limit budget increases to enrollment increase and inflation. While an enrollment increase with 1,400 new students is 2.3%, and inflation at the end of May was at 2.8%. So that's 5.1%. So we're well below that benchmark. <clears throat> This is just our, our budget in a, in a pie chart. Uh, it can show it by a major object, and it shows that our payroll budget is 89.2% of our budget, very uh, people intensive. Uh, contracted services is 5.4% of our budget. The largest item in there is our utility bills. Uh, supplies and materials is 4.1%. The largest single item in there is fuel. And then equipment and other is 1.3% of our budget, and the largest item in there is our property insurance. Uh, so, as we're looking, our 2018-2019 proposed budget is $495 million, $459,113. So what's, what's next? Uh, like I said, hopefully we'll be receiving a, a certified <coughs> values this week, but no later than the 25th. Uh, August 7th, we have a public hearing on the budget. And then we'll also have a public hearing on the 21st, and then at the board meeting on the 21st, we'll ask for uh, the board's approval of the budget and the tax rate. I have one question. We, I yes, think we have several. several. So. Go, ahead. Go, ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Whoever. Uh, where did you account for the reserve excess? Yeah. Where so, did you account for the reserve excess? The excess over reserve, or expected reserves for 25% of our budget? It's in the fund balance. It's in the fund balance? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's in the fund balance, but in the budgeting, the incremental pickup year over year, did you capture it there or you just added it to the fund balance? It just added to, if I understand your question, it's just added, at the end of the year, it just adds to the fund balance. Okay. Yeah, and this, bu this budget that we're presenting tonight is just balanced. There is no reserve uh, accumulating in that. We, we're not budgeting any, any increase to fund balance for, for next year. Although, you know, but we have the 11 we'll million have. from this year. We'd still have that 11 million. Yes, you're correct. Okay. That is still in there. Okay. Yeah, that that, that 11.34 million that we're mm -hmm. talking about, we're not we're not utilizing those funds in the current budget that we're presenting. I understand. So it's just essentially rolls. Correct. Correct. A um, question for you or Dr. Sharples, maybe, I don't know, whoever can answer it. Do we ever actually maintain 100% budgeted staffing? No. That's okay, why. I didn't think so. That's why we had that payroll adjustment. That payroll yeah. budget uh, adjustment you see. One mil. Yeah. That's, that's what I was thinking about. Yes. And correct me if I'm wrong, this includes the additional 18 officers that we've been talking about to increase yes, security. 16, at 16 new police 16 officers. 16 new police officers at our campus, because I know we've discussed that a lot in the last board meeting and in our workshop. Um, so we're, we're budgeting in those new officers to help with safety and security. And I know the homeless liaison, we got the grant mm -hmm. for that. So we have that to yes, help with some of those issues. Um, what is, I mean, because I think normally in the past, we've had a, a plan or a comment about what we're doing with the 
excess reserve. Right. Um, what's what is our plan for well, that eleven yeah, in, million? Yeah, right at the if, end of this year. Yeah, in our in our budget objectives, you can see that we're just uh, our, our statement is we're going to utilize that surplus uh, to support our capital projects, um, mm -hmm. reduce our bond debt requirements. Um, I think you'll see a proposal come up uh, in in August that I'll have Mr. Roebuck here with me to present pr present an, an item to y'all, and then cover any unforeseen in expenditures that are out there. So similar to the slide you had before where you show where our excess, the one with the red tops, a uh, little graph deal there where it yes. shows. Okay. Yes, sir. So you're expecting the same kind of approach to that excess to use those to pay off some capital project that we have ongoing, ongoing correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Or any projects any project. with any the project. facilities yeah, assessment that we, we are currently doing, maybe that $11 million will go towards will some of the facilities that need transition fund updating. between bond referendums, something like that, as, as a two, the 2015 bond referendum, you know, completes, we'll need some transition funds to do some projects. And that's not necessarily, I mean, we've done that in the past. We don't necessarily have to continue to do Correct. that if we choose to put it towards something else. We've just done that towards capital improvements. And, and this budget here is based off of the AV at 5.7. So if it gets higher than that, yeah. it, then we, we get yeah. extra. The, the, the last reports I got, uh, there was still about $800 million in the ARB. If you remember, there was over $12 yeah. billion dollars in ARB. And at that right. time, we were almost 12% we growth. Uh, on Monday, we still had $800 million in, in review. And our, our, our increase is at 5.86%. So, so we're right at the 5.7%. I think that's yeah. where we'll We're probably pretty we'll confident. Be. But, yeah. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. Uh, because it is a transfer to debt service mm -hmm. when we funded uh, Wilkinson Elementary, for, for yes. example. Yes, okay, sir. it's not a part of this budget. But when do when does that actually? Uh, I'm I'm kind of following up on a question. I, I'm, I'm <laughs> no, asking the please. same question. Okay, <laughs> when did we know we were going to transfer that? 17 million you know 17 million to to the each to the each thing. each august at the end of the at the end of the budget when when we determine that we that there are funds available we will bring a resolution to the board that, that's right it is we because have went through right. the budget because it's not a part of we, this budget actually is, other is, than being correct yeah. okay correct that's right. that's what i, I right. think they that's, were asking and i yeah. wasn't sure either when, when did we actually hear about that well, but in august when we know it's actually there correct correct right Sometimes, I mean, we transfer funds to debt service and then we'll also transfer funds to the capital project. Okay, fund. fair enough. Yeah, so yeah. There, there, there's we, two type of transfers. We've done it where we've, we've given it to um, child nutrition a couple of times. We did it for the health fund we, and, yeah, we in did 16 the because yeah, we needed yeah. to bolster it. So, yeah, the eight million dollars this year for, for irons, right? We, we did. Uh, Mid-January, something like that. If yeah. I, I, I guess my question was, I mean, I just wanted to make sure we're utilizing the funds, and you answered that. I didn't want yeah. us to continue to, um, you know, continue to grow a reserve that's not necessarily useful. Right? Correct. Okay, so we're good. And he tries to keep it at 25% when he gets over that. Yeah, then we start. So we, we can look towards probably towards September system. discussing, because yes, I know the August board meeting, we won't fully be done, but more towards September discussing what happens with <clears> 11 million. Yes, ma'am. Okay. I'm good. That also keeps us at that low tax rate as well. Yes, it does. A healthy. And to answer your question from earlier, Magnolia's tax rate is $1.38. And they're? And they're going to, they want to keep it. They're just going to do a penny exchange if the okay. PRE passes, but it's still 10 cents higher than ours. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Good job. All right. Legal. Item 7A. Consider oh, of, uh, approval of the pilot program with Tri-County. Oh, I'm sorry. I oh. totally missed that. Sorry. 6B, consider award of RFP donor check. <laughs> we spent a lot of time on the budget, Mr. Rice. I'm sorry. <laughs> <All right. laughs> you were in the video. Yeah, we're... <laughs> Y'all are tired of seeing Please forgive me. Right, yeah. Please forgive my error. Donor ink cartridges. Donor and ink cartridges. Let's talk about toner and ink <laughs> Uh, tonight, I'm recommending. 
Is Tonight right? I'm recommending uh, the Board of Trustees award RFP 18-03-03 toner and inkjet cartridges to the Treehouse and Daniel Office products for an estimated annual expenditure of $435,000. A request for proposals pertaining to this purchase of OEM and remanufactured toner and inkjet cartridges for the district were emailed to 202 vendors through the electronic e-bidding system, 25 submitted bid responses. The proposal was advertised two times in the courier. Unit pricing was requested for new and remanufactured toner and inkjet cartridges and a catalog discount to quote additional toner and inkjet cartridges through July 20, 21. Proposals were evaluated by the purchasing department and funds are provided in the CISD general fund. Best value uh, offers are recommended for board approval at this time. I recommend your approval. So moved. All right. Second, Mr. Williams. Any questions about our expensive toner and ink jet? <laughs> I think will because this is a problem in my office. <laughs> problem in all I think it's office. a problem. Yeah, everybody yeah, has the same I, I problem. Take it to the extreme. <laughs> so, question I have Are we going making strides to go more paperless? I mean, is, is, that, is that kind of our approach to this thing? Yeah. 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 A lot of the a lot of the um, previous programs that you have purchased have allowed us to do that. Canvas, for example, it's our learning management mm -hmm. system allows a lot of things to go paper paperless. Um, even within our administrative functions through through Darren's office and finance, but also through special education or um, bilingual and ESL services, we've bought programs that allow us to do much more of our work online rather than with paper. There's still a, there's still a point yeah. where paper is necessary, but the we- The re-registration uh, of our children yes, the for the new school system is fabulous. Unbelievable, <laughs> unbelievable. Yeah, instead of sending every, all 63,000 students home with a big packet on the first day, they log in now, so. Yeah, that's outstanding. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I believe uh, my 15-year-old son believes that school is paperless. <laughs> that might be for different reasons, Mr. Hubert. <laughs> it's all on the phone. Anything else? All right. All those in favor? Thank you. Consider award of RFQ 18-06-01 school buses, item 6C. Yes, we're recommending the Board of Trustees award RFQ 18-06-01 school buses to Thomas Bus Gulf Coast for our 77 passenger buses and Rush Bus for our 10 passenger Type A MPV uh, for an estimated annual expenditure of $1.1 million. Requests for quotations pertaining to the purchase of school buses for the district were emailed to 51 vendors through the electronic e-bidding system. Three vendors responded. Unit prices were requested for new build school buses and 10 passenger MPVs that meet or exceed specifications and to remain firm through September of 2018. After evaluating the responses, CSD can purchase 10 77 passenger school buses and one 10 passenger MPV. These buses will be used for replacing buses that have met their life expectancy and for student growth. Proposals and recommendations were evaluated by members of the transportation department and reviewed by the purchasing department. Funds for this purchase are provided for in the capital projects fund. I recommend your approval. Move. Second. Okay. Well, questions. <laughs> when will they be? When will they be delivered? It's usually a four to six month process to build because they actually build these buses once we order. So it's a four to six month uh, time frame before we get those in. Okay. And then, as far as these are going to be used to retire older buses, what criteria do you use to retire the, the buses? Uh, Sam, are, are you Mr. Davila? Are you? Are you? In, could, could you answer the question as to what criteria do you use to uh, retire a bus? Well, the poor coaches are still driving one with 85 on it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't guess they leave town. <laughs> um, <clears throat> actually, uh, we look at mileage and then serviceability. Um, our our mechanic does mechanic shop does a fantastic job, so we do have buses that are 20 plus years old that we keep on the road. Um, buses are built to last for that purpose. And uh, so um, we don't retire them very often. When we do, usually they go to the scrapyard because no one else can really use them that much anymore. And we kind of recycle parts as well yeah. out of our buses. So we don't always send them directly to um, salvage or <laughs> use other parts off of them. And it just kind of helps us save money and it gets us, uh, you know, keeps the fleet running. Gotcha. Cool. It takes four to six, four to six months to, to get them in. 
starting, I mean, obviously, if, if this gets approved today, then when's that clock start? I'm just curious when we... PO should go out tomorrow. Yeah, we'll send it out to the vendors tomorrow, and uh, since these are new bills, like uh, Mr. Rice said. Okay. Um, the MPVs, they're a little different, so they take a little bit longer to make than the standard for 77, 78 passenger buses. Well, and correct me if I'm wrong, we bought some used buses from another district that Mackinac were just, getting yes. rid of those to help with um, some of our needs of buses to cut down on some of the new bus costs that we were That's great, anticipating. Yes, yeah, we got a very good deal on uh, some Bluebird buses, and they already they were uh, 10 to 13 model buses, had AC, so it really fit into our fleet well. We already had existing Bluebird buses as well, so we didn't have to worry about parts and, and all those kind of things. So uh, they've been uh, an asset to the district. No, I, I have no idea what the answer to this question is. So is this, why did we look at propane for a while, and why are we or are we not looking at propane in the future with the cost of diesel going up and that, that, that? Uh, we looked at it at first because there was an incentive, and a lot of our buses at the time, or some of our buses, met the criteria for the grant, which was you uh, had to uh, get rid of some buses in order to buy buses. Um, because of our growth and because of um, just the number of buses we need, we can't really get rid of buses anymore. Uh, a lot of it is growth. Um, the buses that we would possibly use uh, in, like, uh, current grants, um, are done through attrition. So we have buses, unfortunately, that still get hit by cars. Um, so they may be totaled. And so now we can't really afford to, let's say, uh, scrap 10 buses so that we can get the grant to help offset the cost of 10 new propane buses. And how much more expensive are they? Uh, the propane buses actually have come down. Um, uh, so uh, you're looking at about 100 and I think about 110,000 for a propane Versus bus. 90. Uh, we're 92, 93. Well, I take that back because now they have seat belts, so that's about an $8,000 additional charge. So our new buses, diesel buses, now are around 98000 So uh, a propane bus would be about 118000 or so. So there's a $20,000 difference, and there's not a $20,000 fuel without the grant. There's not a $20,000 fuel savings over the life of that bus. The um, well, uh, I'm for not trying to trap you. I'm just, right. I, I, well, I for example, um, it depends on on the railroad commission who um, uh, oversees the propane, and we got a reimbursement check of around forty-eight. I can't remember now. Forty-eight fifty thousand for the thirty-five propane buses we have now. So, if you want to do the math, you can kind of figure out how much each bus is bringing in savings and how long that would take to pay off. But in the in the actual fuel cost mm -hmm. per mile. What is the propane versus the diesel? Uh, propane gets roughly uh, about three to four miles per gallon. Diesel gets around seven to eight. And so the cost of propane is about, I want to say we're paying a dollar a gallon. Uh -huh. And diesel um, was about three, three dollars, somewhere around there, 280. So I hadn't, I hadn't done the math uh, to, you know, off the top of my head to see what the savings would be per gallon per mile. Would you mind work it, yeah. working that up yeah. for me? Uh, just yeah. in your spare time when you're not trying to bus route everything. You know, like, <laughs> yeah. You know, no. it's, but, I mean, what you just told me, uh, just a quick calculation in my head doesn't, I mean, I, I'm not worried about the grant. I'm worried about the long-term fuel savings because <coughs> diesel's going through the roof. Right. right. And that was uh, one just, of the reasons why I think we went to propane to help offset the cost some. Uh, and it gave us an alternative fuel source to use as well, and plus it's green. So okay. there was a lot of positive things for that. How many Thanks. propane stations do we have? We have one which is in the Conroe Center. Okay, so you would have to actually get all the buses over there to service it as opposed to diesel. You can pretty much get anywhere, right? Yes, sir. Uh, each of our four centers have diesel. Um, and is, is it possible to enter another propane station? It is. Um, there's some grants out there. Yeah, but something you have to take into account when you're doing your analysis. I mean, if we're going to go to a more of a, we're going our portfolio is going to be more heavy on the propane. How many additional um, propane stations will we need to service those? those, those It'd probably at least one north and one south, and we have the north one already. Uh, but all the propane buses we have are serviced out of Conroe. So when yeah, we buy new buses, we kind of yeah, offset them, and, and so spread them out throughout the district. Conroe. So you have them all yeah. in Conroe. Yeah. Right? yeah. Wrong. How many how many propane buses Good. again you said? Um, uh, yeah, you have to add that. So I think about thirty five. Okay, well. and when total you, fleets. When you, when you, when you look at list. other large bus fleets like city bus fleets of big town, you know they they've all go to, gone to 
propane mm -hmm. and other or CNG or mm -hmm. CG, yeah. And of course, they have to carry tanks all over the top of the bus and everything else with that, but it, because it takes more volume, right? But, or, or space, it just, does. The, the propane tanks are larger yeah. because it takes more Thank fuel you. to um, go the same Almost distance as you would with a diesel or gasoline bus. Yeah. But, but on the other yeah. hand, a school bus is perfect for that because it yeah. very same. few of them drive. A whole bunch of miles a piece, you know, without. Well, at least they they drive short distances. Um, um, we run about seven million miles a year, so. Right. No, no, no. I, I understand you drive a lot of miles, but not not even not long haul. Route each route is, each route is right. sixty or hundred miles or whatever. Right. You know, well within its range. How many are in our active fleet right now? How many buses? Um, um not propane thirty five, but total fleet. Five. Yeah, Forty-eight, I believe, is what we have uh, uh, buses in our fleet. Okay, but are actively running routes? Some of those are spares. Some of those for trips. Okay. Um, we have three hundred eighty routes. Three hundred eighty routes. Mm -hmm. And then the MPVs that we use also is in addition okay. to those. Okay. Yeah, I I agree with Mr. Husbands on this. I'd like to see the the math on that as well. Okay. So. I know I know it's an additional you know a purchase. Uh, you know, cost upfront capital, and, but uh, I think we really need to look long term at that because, yeah. uh, I mean, those fueling stations we had the one built in Conroe. I, I met the guy that did that, and uh, mm -hmm. and he, uh, it's not it's not that unreasonable. But anyway, let's look at it. Is the life cycle of a propane bus as long as a diesel bus? No, sir. Um, you know, it's a gasoline engine, so um, you only get 150, 200 thousand miles out of the engine, whereas a diesel. 250, 300,000 miles. That's another so consideration. Okay, so that's another consideration in the yeah, cost it, that we'd like to see. Also, from your mechanic's perspective, how more difficult, if at all difficult, is it to work on a propane? Engine it versus was a little at first. Uh, they had to get used to the different fuel system and uh -huh. how it's delivered. Um, but now, and at least all of our technicians in the Conroe Center, because they work on those. But as far as the body and the chassis and everything else, it's all pretty much it's the same. It's just the engine and the, uh, and the delivery system for the fuel. That's just a little bit different. Okay. I got one more question, just more of the going, going back to the 10 buses that we're, we're looking at. <laughs> because, I, you know, you're, obviously, you know, your time's coming in a couple of weeks whenever all those buses go back out. Just here. I didn't know his time was coming. I, know. <laughs> I didn't know where we were going. Oh, no. You know something I don't know, right? I knew what I did. phrased that a little differently. Been nice. It was not in on that. It's killing me. No, I don't have that kind of power anyway. But yeah, what, I'm, what I'm asking is, on on the, I know you're going to retire 10 buses. Out of curiosity, how do you determine where these new 10 buses go? Because I know you have some buses that don't have air conditioners that, that are, you're trying to put in and things of that nature. Do they go to the new, newest routes? Are they, is it a, you know, this bus is coming out and you're getting a new bus? How, how do you determine it? Because I know that, it, well, I'm probably going to get those questions as well mm -hmm. when the, whenever the kids go back and your time <laughs> is on <laughs> putting all the routes back. That's a much um, better phrase. You knew phrase. what I meant. Ordinar <laughs> ordinarily, we, um, we would just divide the buses out so each area of the district would get two or three new buses. Okay. Um, but they're a little bit different with this one because these have a, uh, seat belts. So um, we're kind of following the same practice we used when we started getting AC buses 15 years ago or so. Mm -hmm. um, Little kids first. The, well, the priority is the elementary kids with the longest runs. Yeah. Um, so, and then we're also taking, you know, and instead of with AC, which is ride time, we're looking at capacity. So we want to get the most students in the most seat belt buses that we can. So we are looking at, you know, load, uh, load counts, what has the highest load counts. Okay. And then we can spread it out across our three tiers as well. Um, you know, so, I mean, there are different, I'll get some inquiries as well. As what, should we put them on this type of route? Should we put them on those type of routes? But that seems the best practice. And we only have uh, eight of those buses right now. So as the district continues to buy buses with seat belts, then, you know, it'll be like AC buses where eventually every bus will have a seat belt, just like every bus will have an AC. Are we going to make these kids wear the seat belts? <laughs> Absolutely. Yes, sir. When I say we make them, I mean, there are consequences. We have the policy in place. Um, for students and we're adding it to the student brochure so they'll know there are consequences and it's not going to be because it's a learning environment it's like anything else so uh, they'll get some warnings and then you know written up um, 
bus referrals, and then if a student still refuses to ride with the seatbelt, um, then they, they could lose their bus riding privileges. Um, so it Skeeter, is a state law. You need to law. warn the boys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But it is a state law. They're required. If the bus is so equipped with a seatbelt, they are required by law to wear the seatbelt, just like in a passenger car. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thank y'all very much. Yeah. Nice job. All those in favor? Motion passes. Item 6D, financial reports. Mr. Rice. All right. I'll present the financial statements for the district for the month of June. These statements will include our general fund, debt service, child nutrition, and self-funded insurance. And we'll start once again with our balance sheet. Our balance sheet includes our assets, liabilities, and fund balances of the district. Uh, each month we like to look at our cash and investments. And here we'll concentrate once again on the general fund. We'll see we have cash on hand of $500. We have bank deposits of $106,000. We have investments in our state pools of $63 million. Uh, we have investments with uh, Wood Forest National Bank of $30 million. Our shorter term investments that are less than a year, we have $74 million. And our longer term investments managed by TCG Investment Advisors, $51.7 million for total cash and investments of $219 million. Just a quick look at property taxes. Uh, property tax collections are, are right on pace where we've been in the past, so we feel very good about that. Taking a look at our income statement, our income statement includes our revenues and expenditures and fund balance. Our revenues are broken down into three categories. That's local and intermediate sources, state program revenues, federal program revenues. Looking at the detail of our local and intermediate sources, as you can see, property taxes are the largest generator of revenues in our general fund and debt service. It's food sales and food service and premium contributions and self-funded insurance. We can also look at our year-to-date expenditures by major category for each of the funds. <clears throat> our projected fund balance change in the general fund, our projection has not changed to about $2 million increase to our fund balance. And that same uh, with child nutrition, about $177,000 increase, same as last month. Last month. Our 2015 bond referendum status update, uh, we've currently expended and encumbered $467 million. We have an estimate to complete of $57 million, giving us a project forecast to complete the bond program of $524 million, leaving us a little over $4 million worth of contingency. <clears throat> uh, Self-funded insurance for the month of June, we got back on track. Uh, we had about $190,000 uh, revenues over expenses uh, for that month. For the year, we've had total revenues of $40 million. Uh, we had total expenses of $37 million, giving us revenues over expenses um, for the year of $2.7 million. And participation in our wellness centers uh, remains strong. Uh, we have our employees visiting our centers, and uh, we're proud about that. Uh, and we've had 5,260 visits on the year. Looking at our investments, Par value of our portfolio is uh, $499 million. Um, our pools are yielding about 2.14%. Our investments with Wood Forest National Bank, 2.15%. <clears throat> TCG Investment Advisors. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm sorry. That, that, that short, our short-term investments, like I said earlier, less than one year, 1.85%. Our longer-term investments uh, with TCG Investment Advisors, 1.53%. They, they continue to work to, to bring that, that rate that rate up. It's just we're waiting on investments to mature. Sure. I mean, they're, they're out there a long time, so we're just waiting on those to mature and, and become uh, feasible to either sell them if we can or, or reinvest. Uh, leaving us with a combined portfolio that has a, a WAM of 53 days, yielding 2.05%, and our benchmark, which is the 90-day T-bill, is at 1.86%. Okay. And thank you. Any questions? No, thank you. Now, item 7A, consider <laughs> approval of the pilot program with Tri-County Behavioral Health. Thank you. Um, the district's requesting your approval tonight to, for, to allow us to participate in a pilot program with Tri-County Behavioral um, Health Care Services. The pilot program will provide uh, mental health related services to students attending Armstrong and Grangerland Intermediate Schools. The pilot program, if you approve it, would begin at the start of the year at both of the campuses. Staff from Tri-County will have space on each campus to meet with students and their families for pre-intake and intake visits. These visits are necessary for students and families to begin services through Tri-County. 
The hope is that by having this service available to families closer to their homes, student attendance will improve and more families can access the services that Tri-County has to offer. Tri-County will also be able to um, provide parent and family educational opportunities in the areas of trauma prevention, mental health awareness, and suicide prevention awareness. They will be able to assist district staff with crisis intervention needs and will provide prevention services to students who are identified by parents, school staff, or other adults as being at risk for substance abuse, delinquency, and violence, um, and teaching them life skills to provide the emotional support for difficult family and peer situations. Armstrong and Grangerland were chosen for the pilot because both schools indicated a strong need and a desire for more mental health resources to be available to serve their communities. If the programs are successful, the district and Tri-County will look to expand the program to other campuses, including high schools. We believe that it's better to start the pilot at smaller schools so we can work out any issues before we try to bring them to the bigger, faster moving environments of our high schools. Karen Jones and Tricia Thacker, the principals of Granger Land and Armstrong, um, will be the point persons at their campuses for the programs. And Ms. Sapola and our guidance and counseling department will be working with both the campuses and Tri-County as well. At the end of the school year, um, the pilot will be evaluated to determine if it should, should be expanded. We will look at attendance, discipline, and nurse visits to help to measure the impact the program has had on each of the campuses. We're very close to finalizing the final terms of the interlocal agreement. Um, it addresses the confidentiality of how we will address each other's records and, of course, the responsibilities for both the district and Tri County. Mr. Robertson, Evan Robertson the, is the director of Tri County and he's here to answer any questions you have, as is Ms. Sapola. And if you approve our participation in the pilot, we will ask that you delegate the authority to sign the agreement to Dr. Null so that we can finish the negotiations and get it in place to start at the beginning of the year. So moved. Second. All right. Yes. Discussion, questions? Yes. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, I don't know who to ask. I was so going to say, wait let's for them bring to come to the stage. Because <laughs> Thank you for being here yeah. tonight. Yes. Thank you very much. Good evening. Thanks for having me. Go ahead. Go ahead, John. I'll, I'll yield to you. My question, Ben, was one of your last points. Are teachers and nurses and principals and assistant principals um, allowed to have the information that you have on your clients? I, You know, I, I, I see a... I mean, there's different, it's kind of like doctor's records versus, you know, are you feeling well today? You know, that kind of thing. So uh, I was just, I was concerned at that, that and, and maybe a, a... I don't think they'll have the, that information. I mean, I think that our, our information in a way is separate. The teachers may make a referral. Um, the parents will have to sign permission forms allowing us to share information ahead of time, which would be required under our FERPA laws and your HIPAA laws as well. And so really through... Good consent written consent by the participant but the actual yes. diagnosis that some you know somebody has is not necessarily shared with the school unless it's the nurse maybe uh, if there's medication or something yeah maybe and the diagnosis and, may not be and important there's, there's rulings for that I mean, they, they're, right they, and, yeah. and we may know the student through special education anyway and have a diagnosis through that it could be different than the diagnosis that that they give them okay so we're i think we we feel really comfortable with the records sharing us all, all that I just don't want our, our, our wonderful educators to be put in a, this is great, I'm, I'm all for it, but I just don't want them to be put in a position where confidential information is, is breached and they're in trouble for something when they're trying to help, you know. Uh, that, that, you know, Mr. Good Guy sometimes, Mr. Mr. Good Samaritan sometimes gets sued, you know. So One of the advantages of the younger students is that we do have consent um, most of the time, almost all of the time. Uh, sometimes when we get into high school age kids, uh, consent issues get a little bit fuzzier. Uh, but for these young young kids, we've looked at, at many of the kids that are in our services today that the schools are aware of and uh, that we already have consents on file to share that information. And with proper consent, we can share just about anything uh, with the schools that they need to know. It's still a need to know basis, so we're not gonna share extraneous information or anything in our chart uh, but there would be information that would be important for both parties and the, and the communication back and forth is exciting for us um, I know I visited with uh, principal Jones at Grangerland Intermediate and she's like you know I've got this kid and he, his mom tells me he's in services and we're not seeing any changes and 
and uh, we checked, we had consent, we looked him up, and sure enough, this kid has never followed up with services. So just that communication piece really could make a big difference for these students and the, and the schools. I, I do have a couple of questions. I love the idea. That I think this is awesome. Thanks for at least even entering into the conversation because these kids who need these services and we can help provide that. I, I love that. Could you share with me What's a typical day? What, what, what does that look like to you on a typical day when you show up at a campus? So our plan is to have a, a staff based at the campus to work with students who are already in our services. And, and the, the two principals have identified space for us to be there. These are kids that have already been through our entire process and will go um, and we'll just have access to them. It means less time out of, out of classes for the kids and, and more consistent care. Uh, one of our big challenges with the younger kids is that oftentimes they're only available for a couple of hours in the evenings and they're playing football and doing all the other things and it makes it very difficult to contact those kids. Um, so we'd have somebody there to do those services, also to do some group activities. Uh, we'll have a second staff that will do some of the, the intake um, uh, services that Ms. Klaus was referring to a second ago regarding just trying to get them from the point of, hey, I need treatment to I'm in treatment. And we find a lot of these families struggle with that kind of uh, process and I, I don't think we're overly bureaucratic in that but there are many steps one of the big problems for us is ensuring that we have all the proper um, uh, guardianship documents for the parents mental health care is one of those things that divorce decrees oftentimes dictate only one party can have and it becomes a big hot button and we can help with that because we usually we, have those documents you know, so and we usually don't <laughs> we struggle pretty mightily to get those things out. So um, we'll have another staff there to, to do the intake function and also to do therapy. Um, therapy with some of these kids will be something that's uh, pretty basic and others will be uh, more complicated. Would we'll be available to assist with crisis services. CSD is very uh, fortunate. You have a lot of resources already in the school districts. Not all the school districts do. But we would be available to assist, especially with the more complex kids that may need placement in a hospital or something, which hopefully won't see too many third graders who need that. But uh, unfortunately, we are seeing more and more younger students um, showing up in our crisis services every day. Okay. And, uh, so uh, we also have a third group that's going in that will provide uh, prevention uh, education on substance abuse. And we also have talked about targeting those the kids that go into those groups are kids that the teachers will be worried about and we can kind of watch those kids and see if they might need an additional referral so we start with anger management some of the basic things that a lot of these kids are dealing with and then we may see some kids that actually need more uh, developed care so at that point we can refer them to the intake process and, and push them into our system if they if they're ready for that i i understand that this is a different type of service than the counselors are offering at the school districts but do you will there be any additional I usually use the word work, but is there any additional work or requirements from our counselors that's going to be required to help with, with, with this? It's program? all help. It's, <laughs> it's just, it's help. It's what is, is happening now, and we have those consents from most of our parents when we refer, refer a family and a student to Tri-County for a risk assessment or, or as a referral resource for therapy. Um, as he mentioned, oftentimes they don't get there. Um, we even have counselors and crisis specialists who travel with them and meet them there, um, encouraging in that intake. Um, but really, uh, the challenge in these two particular zones is transportation for many of our families and um, not being able to leave work uh, for fear of losing sure. their livelihood. Yeah, and so having the services available in these two zones yeah. is a win-win for all of us. Mm -hmm. It really helps our students get the services that they need and helps us coordinate with the therapist directly so that we're really working on that safety plan and that transition and, and helping them from both avenues and both sides. Awesome. So I, I know we have to, we have to crawl before we walk. So I, I get that. And I, I love the, the program. But there was a couple of things that you touched on, which was, uh, and I wrote down just suicide preventions, uh, substance abuse, violence, things of that nature. And I would assume, I don't know, so I'm just going to assume that the way that, that kids at Armstrong and Grangerland or the elementary and junior high are going to deal with that differently than at a high school. So I know you said we want to start there and move towards a high school. But isn't it true that the high schools have a different set of circumstances and, and I don't know that you can, I, I don't know that you can apply that. So I'm just curious, is there a way to, to, to put a high school in the pilot program as well or, 
Are we just am I just asking too much? <laughs> am I getting too far ahead of myself on that? Yeah. I think you're too our head. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're trying well, to get just, our systems you know. in place. You know, like who do we need and when do we need them? And it, it's not not necessarily the services that you'll provide. It's us working together and figuring out all those little pieces so that we can we can really. Get I, it I think right. a, another piece of that is we want to make sure we get it right yes. because this yeah. is we, we want this to be able to be sustained. Our high schools are are more heavily staffed on the counseling side than our elementaries are. So when you look at where there may be, you know, there may be bigger challenges at the high school, but we do have a, yeah. a heavier counseling staff, which allows them to intervene a little more. Um, so that, you know, some of these elementaries become a focus uh, where it can really be helped. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, he'll come back in later. <laughs> He's still thinking. Yeah. yeah. No, I thank you. Go ahead. How did this how this how how does this cut into or play into uh, managing a certain amount of classroom time? Um, how do we balance that? Good question. Well it actually increases for some of our students who were having to um, take a, an appointment during the school day and then their parents would take them to Tri-County for services and they'd never return back to school. They'd go ahead and take the whole day off. Um, that was more common uh, or just not going at all to the appointment. And so it should help in the attendance and in the, the, um, the ability to, to help these families in that it's a short window, um, a therapeutic appointment, 50 minute appointment and back into class, or perhaps it's an intervention that's 30 minutes or a lesson, um, a skills lesson that's 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just providing those services more regularly than being piecemeal, I think. Which helps help overall. Both. You know, it's both. It, it helps it, the it day. It helps classroom time, but Correct. it also, you know, after all, uh, attending your appointments is going to help our school consistently you know, care. with yes. our with we our talk a lot about ev executive function and the ability to concentrate and if you've got all this turmoil going on inside your head you it's very can't. difficult to focus yeah. uh, we do think that we'll actually have kids in camp in school more but it's one of the metrics that we want to monitor in this pilot is that uh, specifically at Armstrong Elementary which is less than two miles from our main facility here in Conroe um, but the uh, now, Principal Thacker there indicated that a lot of these kids check out 10, 11 o'clock in the morning and never come back for an appointment with us. Yeah. And so uh, we feel like we can we can shorten that substantially. Your, your, your presence will, I give rise, I guess, more folks want to seek your service as well, right? I mean, so are, are there restrictions or are there some sort of limitations that we're, we're putting in play as to, not necessarily limitations, but I mean, you're going to have capacity issues, right? I we, we, that more we, folks want to um, take advantage of services that you guys provide. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I, I would really rather get into the prevention business. I, I don't need any more clients. That's really, we have no interest in that, but you're right. And my experience has been anytime you build a mental health program, it fills rapidly. Um, and we, we, we build them and a lot of times they're full even before we've finished building them. Um, so maybe that will be the case. I don't really have a lot of... Um, inside ability to look at the kids and know whether we'll see more, but I expect we probably will. I expect you will. I just and want to make sure we, we uh, mission is still, you know, proper priority as far as education and kids and mental health is a part of that, of course. I want to just make sure that we don't understand our focus here. So, agree. I hear what you're saying. And part of that, Mr. Williams, is to, to as Carrie said, start small, see how the pilot's Agreed. working Agreed. and evaluate Agreed. those Agreed. things. Again, I'm, we're, we're jumping ahead of ourselves, so. I think the program is um, outstanding. I appreciate you guys coming and partnering with CISD. And I think it's going to be an invaluable program for the district at large. So, I wanted to recognize um, Rod Chavez, our director of outreach. He was integral. He was integral. He was integral in creating this partnership. We appreciate it, but don't give so. him the mic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mr. Moore, I know you have. Yeah. Some questions, comments? Um, I wanted to return back to the the information sharing side of it. Um, we we get an update every month on safety and security, and we're looking at budgeting for additional police officers. And um, I respect the need to know there's there's a difference in a school nurse needing to know that a child needs medication or that a classroom teacher needs to know that a child may need some accommodations based on some mental health struggles. 
that's a totally different section of need to know than school safety. And I just want to make sure that I have it reinforced in open record and as part of this agreement that issues of school safety will be directly and immediately shared with our school staff if there's any indication that any of these clients pose any kind of danger that they've voiced any kind of assaultive yeah. behavior or, or tendencies. The FERPA HIPAA line there, Ms. Gless, I'd have to refer to well, you yes. on. I mean, it's, it's, it's a strange line. It is me. a strange line. And I think that, you know, they will be um, designated as a person that we can share information with as long as it's a legitimate educational interest. And I would certainly say if we had a concern about a student, we would be able to share it with them as, as an agent of the school. And as far as HIPAA goes, I think that they would probably take the necessary steps and alert us. Um, or at least they can call the ISD police just like like we can or keep the student or see about arranging. I, mean, I don't, it isn't addressed specifically in our agreement. We, had, we have addressed records and information under FERPA and under HIPAA. We haven't carved out anything for student safety because it really has to fall under, there's a, there's a student safety exception under FERPA for mm -hmm. health and safety emergencies. I mean, it's a really high bar, but um, we would be able to share information with them, and and so I, I I don't foresee that being a concern. I mean, I think what we have will. Could could you explore the legality of that? Because I, I I would feel much more comfortable if there was some specific explanation of that in our agreement. That let me let me clarify one thing yeah. you're saying. I don't think there's any doubt that we can share with them that right. you have a fear. Right. Okay. I, I, but if, can they share with us? That's the question. That, that's if my if that's a student exactly a makes a, a threat to himself or to someone else, that is what I think Mr. Moore that's is exactly getting right. at, that that would be shared with campus staff immediately so that we take the proper precautions like we do anytime anybody calls kid chat. Um, that would be my understanding of what you could share. Is that correct? My only hesitation is certain license types have certain rules, and so there's some, some weeds there that I would have to dive into, and I'm not 100% sure which license types I'll have in these schools yet because we haven't hired those staff, but certainly there would be an ability to share with back with the school staff, and then they would be able to take action. For sure, I know that we can do that. Okay. What I'm not 100% sure on is that uh, the staff there in the clinic could pick up the phone and call the CISD police. So there's probably an involvement back with the, with the But our principal could then call CISD the police, police and take care of what we can do. Because we have that. consent for that communication between the therapist and the, the counselor, or counselor the and administrator, okay. and then we would then step in with our safety protocols at that point. Because to, to me, the school safety issue is a multi-tiered, multi-faceted thing, and this yes. is one super important component of it, is the crisis intervention and the early diagnosis of potentially violent behavior. And, and I would think most of the time it's going to be the other way around. We're going to be bringing them to right. you, or, or, or referring them, or whatever you want us to bring them to you, whatever. <laughs> but, but on the other hand, if you get a... A, a, what is it? A, you know, an outcry or something in that meeting, mm -hmm. or in that in that visit. Uh, I would I would consider that to be uh, high enough to, you know, it, after all, it's for everybody's protection, especially that child in a lot of cases. And, and I'm assuming now you have protocols. If a, if a student comes to get uh, is receiving therapeutic <coughs> services in your facilities, right. uh, based on their license, you know, the the licensure status of whoever's working with them, if there was a threat made against a, a school, they have a procedure that they would follow today, right. even if it didn't, the therapy did not occur in our building, correct? Right, and I think most of these students are already on the CISD radar, has, yeah. has been my um, brief introduction to the discussions about these kids. So, mm -hmm. yes, um, there are protocols for us to release that information. Okay. Um, I, I think with uh, this particular pilot, one of the things I'm really excited about, and I think the school staff are excited about as well, is just the ability to communicate. Mm -hmm. I think we can we can uh, break down a lot of barriers with communication and, and serve the students better. This is a, a year-long pilot, is that right? And so we'll get a report on that at what point? Sometime in the summertime, probably next probably year? Probably so, yes. Mm -hmm. Hi. Awesome. On the prevention side of things, and with these families, especially transportation being an issue, if issues arise, I mean, and I know we're going to look at doing some anger management and some preventative stuff that we've talked about before, Denise, and, and having y'all help with that. What about preventative for the whole family? Are y'all going to be offering seminars throughout the year 
welcoming parents to come and learn certain things as well on our campuses. So we have two pieces of information that aren't, haven't been shared. One of them is we do have, have, have active conversations with Sam Houston State University, who's very eager to do that very piece. And um, they've talked to us about uh, coming down and doing parent education classes for the groups. Oh, yes. We've also uh, been selected to apply for a <coughs> Houston Methodist grant. And part of that grant funding I'm hoping to use to, and I haven't spoken with anybody at CISD about this yet. <laughs> hoping an email went out, but I haven't heard anything back but yet. Mm -hmm. But uh, to, to bring in maybe some speakers around some of these subjects. We know that bullying, for example, is a form of trauma and that bullying is a driver of some of the violent behavior we've seen in okay. other schools around the United States. And so there would be some opportunities to do some education, for example, on bullying. Uh, prevention of trauma in general is a significant factor. These kids that are in third grade um, have already been through a lot, and it's sad to say, I wish that wasn't true, but oftentimes is the case. So um, at least the kids that are in, in our care. So a lot of education around trauma, prevention of trauma, uh, it would be super exciting for us. And Sam Houston State has a trauma institute. They're very interested mm -hmm. in that care. So. And then the other prevention aspect, I mean, what we found in looking at mental health is the earlier <clears throat> we can get these students involved, and this is part of why we're looking at the elementary and intermediate level, correct me if I'm wrong on this, is it tends to keep incidents happening at that high school level that we've seen in other areas is if we're able to intervene and stop it now, we may not have school safety issues because mental health issues are going undiagnosed at younger and younger age, and it festers and it boils into what we saw with like Santa Fe. Yes, but then also what we're looking at is that prevention piece. So yeah. the coping strategies, the, the, the coping skills becoming habits so that that resilience is developing and that by the time they are in high school, they're looking at other means for support and are more resilient rather than uh, acting out. Correct. Absolutely. Okay. One of the exotic things about working with young kids is they improve <laughs> and we see people get better and they don't yeah. need us anymore, which is just exactly what we want to see. So, so earlier than that, <laughs> improve. So okay. for, for clarification, the motion on the floor is to delegate the authority to go ahead and execute this before the next board call. meeting. Is that yes, to yes. finish the negotiations. We, have, we are so close. Are we? I think you're waiting for one more look by your attorneys and um, and then to go ahead and then authorize Dr. Nall to and, sign it. And yeah. we've all seen we motion, the so. draft agenda, yeah, seen, so, seen or the draft uh, um, agreement. So um, would we see a final before, before he sign it? Okay. I mean, we can send it to you. I mean, but, but no, I know we're delegating yeah. authority to him, but we could we could see the final. If we postponed final approval on this until the next board meeting, would that prevent it from starting for the school year? Yes. Yes. I know that. So we have a motion and a second on the floor. Is there any more discussion? No. All those in favor. Motion passes. Thank you. Thank Mr. you Dave. very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you all thank you. for helping our kids. Thank you for your time on our yes. question. We thank really yes. appreciate Absolutely. that. All right, the next item is executive session. So a closed session of the board will now be held on the matters contained in the notice for this meeting as authorized by section 551.071 and section 551.072 of the Texas Open Meetings Act. Should the board determine that any final action, final decision, or final vote be required with regard to any matter considered in such closed or executive meeting or session, then such final action, final decision, or final vote shall be at either this public meeting upon reconvening of this public meeting or at a subsequent public meeting at, of the board upon notice thereof as the board shall determine. A closed session of the board will now be held. The time is 743.